Hi, I'm Jasper Peach, and along with Women's Health, Lod and Melly, I'm gathering stories from people like me who have compromised immune systems. Here on Jaja Warren Country in Castlemaine, I'm speaking over Zoom with people across the Lod and Melly region. My name is Eden, I'm 31. I live in the Castlemaine uh, region, or uh, I'll just say I live in Castlemaine. <laughs> I am an artist. Uh, I mainly work in performance art, uh, but I also do installation work. Um, I've got a background in theatre and music, so sets and costume, sound, kind of the, the full shebang is my expression of art. I do all the different elements and I love all the different elements. I think if I was to des- describe myself, I guess I believe in being (laughs) post-primal and what I mean by that is I think that we live in a world that's quite harsh and quite fear-based and as somebody who has a chronic uh, medical condition um, and has come quite close to I guess leaving us we kind of dance in a space that not many people are familiar with and quite a a lot of people fear, you know, naturally. And I guess I aim to be somebody who eases those fears and tries not to operate from a place of fear. And that's a lot easier said than done, especially when my life is can be so terrifying at times, I'll be honest. But I think I'm interested, particularly in some new works that I've, I've been working on, like through the pandemic, kind of becoming like a, a fear expert or a fear doula, <laughs> or like a fear dealer, um, but for the purpose of, of being anti-terror, uh, you know, uh, to kind of befriend, I guess, the, the unknowns that we're scared of. Yes, I'm an artist and a fear expert, apparently. <laughs> what does fear feel like to me? It feels annoying. <laughs> it feels frustrating. Um, I wish it would go away. It's the, it's the swamp. It's the swamp. And I love the clear, fresh water. I don't like it at all. But maybe moving past it or through it involves trying to really like it, trying to find a way to live with it and just go, you know what, you're a swamp and that's who you are. So <laughs> I accept it. Even though I don't like your smell, your taste or your look, we are all who we are. I have a very rare autoimmune disease. I think the last time I checked about 6,000 people in Australia with my condition. I couldn't give you the world statistics, but let's just say it's classified as rare. My particular experience of the condition is even more rare because it is usually diagnosed in females who are aged 55 plus. And I was diagnosed when I was five, but my condition is called scleroderma. Uh, The alternative names is Crest syndrome or systemic sclerosis or diffuse systemic sclerosis. And the reason it has a few different names is partially because there is no such thing as my condition. Instead, it is when a person presents with a series of systemic problems that tick enough boxes, that's what is called scleroderma. So my illness is not located to one organ or one aspect. It's a systemic full body experience. And basically my immune system believes that there is something happening inside of me, a pathogen, a poison that is not really there. It's fighting an invisible disease that doesn't exist. And so therefore in that process, it's actually attacking itself. And so my immune system overproduces one of the collagen proteins, uh, which is the one that gets released when you have a wound on your skin. And basically in the overproduction of collagen, uh, my body is in constant hyper wound repair. And so my uh, joints and my connective tissue uh, become fibrotic, like they become um, scar tissue. And the colloquial term for my illness is a person who's turning to stone. I have hand uh, disfiguration from it. It's as it degenerates my flesh and I have a um, facial disfigurement as well. And when I was diagnosed when I was five, 
they didn't believe that I was going to live past 10 because they hadn't even dealt with someone this age before. I spent a lot of time in the Royal Children's Hospital. I was put on to methotrexate, which is a type of chemotherapy um, immune suppressant drug. I was on that for 10 years. But here I am, I'm 31. The illness hasn't taken over and, and um, taken my life. The issue with privacy and being disabled is really the, the genesis of the whole problem for me. We all have human rights and we all have um, our own value systems, which is fine. And there are aspects of it doesn't matter if you're disabled or you're able-bodied. Um, there's things that you would like to keep private for whatever reason, and that's totally normal. But I have found in my experience that I have kept my conditions and my situation private due to survival. I have felt that it is not been safe for me to communicate the truth of my needs and my capacity and my limitations due to a very real understanding that there isn't going to be a procedure or a piece of equipment or a psychological understanding in the other to receive my true needs. And so privacy, when I say that privacy is the genesis or foundation of the issue between ableness and being disabled, that's that's why for me, I don't think that the gap has been bridged sufficiently enough to feel comfortable to truly integrate. And I know there's heaps of great work from heaps of different places, but I'll be honest and say that I don't fully feel comfortable knowing that I'm disabled in what I would describe as an able-bodied world. Then the second level of privacy outside of safety for me would be the lack of privacy that has occurred for those of us who do have compromised immune systems specifically in a viral pandemic that you know truly relies on you having a decent immune system to survive and we're essentially out of it suddenly there are people who never knew that I even had a condition it's it's the top of their priority it's the top of their their knowledge in a pandemic because we've all been outed as having these um, conditions which on one hand helps in terms of access and helps in terms of being able to uh, call your needs but it also doesn't help because maybe I didn't want the whole town to know that I was that way maybe where'd, where'd my choice go and it's like in an emergency and back, back to what I was talking about being post-primal and in a primal response all of the inner nuances and choices and that moment of reflection that just goes out the window in a crisis and for those of us who already live essentially in a 24-7 crisis I mean it feels like just an, another thing so on the topic of privacy that's what that's how I would understand my experience of having a compromised immune system in a pandemic I am afraid and I'm outed and I have no resources to deal with that. I just have to um, overnight change my autonomy on that. I can place my trust in friends. I can place my trust in people who are not necessarily firsthand experienced with illness or chronic illness, but definitely people who have been willing to put in the effort to read the links that I have sent or do their own research in their own time. Like I care about Eden, so I'm going to really look into her illness and have a think of, on my own terms outside of her. What is there something I could do? What is something I could do to help her? You know, really acknowledging like the seriousness of the obstacles I face and on their own terms be able to do that. And I can only, I can say I only have a handful of people that I've engaged with that are close to me that truly go to that that level and that could be for a, a number of different reasons but that's just that's just the case and I guess um with those particular people it's funny I've found myself at times forgetting my own limitations and then going Eden you can't do that or Eden have you thought about this and you know was this there and I'm like oh thank you we also as full-time ill people that have to manage like a manager of, of this wild thing we call disease, we can't always be expected to also be able to remember every single task list and every single 
need. So it's really nice to have people who've done gone off, done the research, they've locked it in. It's not going anywhere. You know, they're taking a bit of that mental burden, a bit of that mental strain off of myself and others by being there. And I saw a fantastic quote a couple of weeks ago that said, solidarity, not sympathy. And that was it for me. That was it. I have friends who have heard about my condition and they are so sympathetic. We're so sorry to hear that. We're so sorry to hear that, right? Which is nice. But then I have friends who are standing in solidarity with me and they, they're they sorry to hear that, but they're bloody doing something about it, you know, in whatever that capacity is, which is different for everybody. I would never ask a friend to become a carer because we are supposed to have carers. That's their job. Like they've, that they want to do that with their life. I don't like to push or challenge my relationships to anything other than what they are. Um, of course, they will be caring like here and then. But um, I think I wonder sometimes if people don't get too close to disabled people because they're worried they're going to have to become their carer. I also don't want people to be in that position and I don't want people to think that. I don't want people to stay away because they're like, it's going to be too much for me. That's awful. That's, that's, I get it, but I don't, that doesn't help either. In some bizarre twist of irony, when the pandemic began, I was the first person all my able-bodied friends called uh, because they were like, you're the only person we know that has any experience with managing illness, managing a compromised immune system that could be attacked at any moment by some invisible thing called disease. We want to know how you do this. It was pretty off the top of my head about the food washing already. I'll just give you some like pandemic examples. Not sharing drinks like ever <laughs> under no circumstance with anyone <laughs> or food scraps or food. Washing of food from supermarkets that just as a side note outside of the pandemic is coated in fecal matter anyway. <laughs> like wash your fresh food. <laughs> um, washing of clothes in like disinfectant stuff and socially or I should say, I don't, I don't like this term, socially distanced. It's ridiculous. Physically distanced. So on a practical level, those are a few things I was quickly firing out that I was essentially already doing because I couldn't, like, survive eating a banana covered in fecal matter on the best of days. <laughs> um, and then the second thing that became really apparent to me was the de mental deterioration of some of my friends who had not even encountered any degree of, of mental illness before um, in any sense that found themselves feeling like they couldn't go on actually um, because it was such a shock and it was so different and what they had come to understand life as being was ripped out from underneath them essentially at the time which is true and is fair enough the advice I gave in that I was like this is why I'm a comedian like an unpaid um, comedian guys I was like this is why I gravitate towards comedy at a constant and comedy shows is because I'm actually trying to subconsciously eliminate a sense of dread. I was like, everyone needs to start engaging with comedy as a medical need. That's what I have been doing. And so it really illuminated, I guess, this concept of for myself, and I don't want to sound histrionic or dramatic, but I feel, I've been in lockdown off and on across my entire life, actually. None of it was government mandated, but I've certainly been locked down due to illness and for my own safety. Um, there was a time when, when I was about 21, the main artery of my leg collapsed and I wasn't unable to walk for about six months. And something really, there was a couple of other things emotionally and family-wise that was going on for me at that time. But I got a, a, um, a fear in my head that if due to my impaired walking, if I was to go out onto the street and if I was to be jumped or attacked, I wouldn't be able to defend myself. And I actually acquired agoraphobia in that time. I became terrified to leave the house because I couldn't trust myself to get away from something like that, which is, I think, a really good example for those who are very removed from the fear and the experience of having a body that is compromised is that you can't trust yourself every day to be able to look after yourself the way that you may need to in some crisis or in some quick getaway or in some someone's grabbed your bag like 
I guess that's the kind of fear that elderly people operate with. And I have a lot of compassion for that. As they've gotten older, they don't have the bodies that they used to. And so they do become scared of the tiniest thing, irritable in public. I get all that. You know, I was 21 and I was that. So having lived through these essentially locked down experiences where I haven't felt safe to leave the house, the fact that the world was going through it at the same time and all of a sudden, and when I was 28 or 29, when the pandemic began, I was like, I'm not trying to be funny or I'm not trying to be um, rude either, but I was like, welcome, guys. Come on in. This is it, yo. This is it. I've been doing this for 30 years. This is it. That was weird. (laughs) That was weird. But um, I'm glad that I was able to provide some insight and support to my friends who were pretty much thrown into a volcano and never heard of any, any such thing. I was cool as a cucumber in that regard. I find myself now with the lockdowns or the we're, we're, we're ostensibly out of the lockdowns, but I find myself navigating uh, through the world in a pandemic as really just an upgraded version of honestly what I was already doing in real life. And I'm not happy with that and I'm not even proud of that, especially moments where I've had to even pre-pandemic physically Um, distance myself from somebody because they were ill like with the flu or whatever that's been hard for people to understand like oh why why won't you have a sip of my drink why won't you have the dip share the dip with us I'm like you don't get it that could kill me I'm handling this pandemic in a way that is like you know what I already know this and I'm carrying on my thoughts is that whether or not a large portion get long COVID or not and we see a mass disabling event or not, I think people need to wake up to the actual nuanced reality of widespread sickness in all its forms, in its entire spectrum, and begin to make changes for that immediately. Whether it's this, whether it's that, whether it's blah, blah, blah. Uh, people are in, uh, if people are in pain, people are suffering. At least the, a lot of the suffering can be prevented by preventative measures and integrative holistic care for these things. I just think We are in a world that is in some sort of gaslight denial of the state of sickness in general. So perhaps a mass disabling event like long COVID is what we needed for people to wake up to the reality of a human being's limitations. We're not AI, we're not robots, we're flesh and we're spirits and we're emotional and we're all very, very different. So I'm pretty sick of being treated like all of us being treated like some sort of robotic emotionless source that just gets a bit oiled up and you're ready to go uh, like how a car would get repaired or whatever Um, I think our actual understanding of life death and illness is completely backwards people need to understand that it's not a criminal experience if you're finding yourself unable to achieve a particular task on a particular day you know one thing that you may have knocked out of the park on a Monday you might not even be able to get out of bed for on a Tuesday welcome to being a human welcome to being alive welcome to being a creature that is moving through time the time and space continuum with multiple things happening and that's okay so if people could stop criminalizing this concept of failure I think that's our our first way in to understanding and healing this issue of us being impaired as a criminal offence. That extends to able-bodied people on the days that they have an impairment of some kind for whatever reason. It's not rocket science to me. I think the first step that people need to take in a pandemic to understand that there are people whose needs are not being met and to understand mm, as much of the scope as possible of how this pandemic is affecting people far and wide. The first thing people need to do is come into their bodies and engage in a a body somatic focused practice that they can really begin to hone in on a relationship with their own body and how their own body feels. And I say that because I believe the notion that if you understand something through an experience, through your own self, can you then 
understand another. If you are so removed from your body and you're so removed from illness and you're so removed from feeling and you're so removed from empathy and compassion and knowledge and the things that occur when you engage with something on a um, psychosomatic level, but I'm obviously talking about somatic level because this is a bodily disease and experience we're all having, then can you help someone in an informed way? Then can you actually, not just by theory or thesis, by some personal knowledge base, can you say, I know what that feels like, I know what that is, and in knowing that, I can help. You can play your part in protecting people in our community who have compromised immune systems. Vaccinate, boost, wash your hands, mask up and stay safe. Women's Health, Lot and Mally, centering the voices of people with compromised immune systems.